Hello, Bob Jondi here again with another Considering Art podcast in which I talk to an artist about their life and their work. Andy Holden is one of those artists who can turn their hand to almost anything. He makes sculptures, installations, animations, multi-screen videos. He paints, he even makes music with his band, The Grubby Mitts. Art has dominated his life since his school days. It was then that he and four of his mates drew up the manifesto for a new art movement called MIMS, Maximum Irony, Maximum Sincerity. Some years later, he resurrected it as an exhibition at the Zabludovich Collection. Called a unified theory of MIMS, it featured reconstructions of conversations and events, and even assembled a school choir and orchestra to perform songs they'd written at the time. Andy Holden first came to prominence in 2010 with his exhibition Art Now, Andy Holden, at Tate Britain. At its centre was Pyramid Piece, a huge knitted boulder that was a replica of a small rocket stolen from an Egyptian pyramid as a boy and later returned. Among many acclaimed shows was one in which he cooperated with his father, Peter Holden, who's a well-known ornithologist, called Natural Selection. Looking at the extraordinary care and attention with which birds build their nests, he posited the suggestion that they were transcending functionality and engaging in works of art. The exhibition toured the country and got five-star reviews. He spent six years working on an hour-long filmed lecture that was narrated by himself as a cartoon figure. Laws of Motion in a Cartoon Landscape was based on the premise that the world had become a kind of cartoon and is best understood as such. It was hailed as a masterpiece by the art newspaper and was included in the 2017 Venice Biennale. His latest exhibition, called The Structure of Feeling, currently running at Block 336 in Brixton in London, takes the form of a fairground ghost train in which viewers navigate their way around in electric vehicles. They stop off at various points to plug into animations, which again feature Holden's own cartoon avatar expounding on different subjects as he navigates a cartoon landscape trying to make sense of the world. There's also a 3D film featuring eyes in space, as well as an assembly of his sculptures. I visited Andy's studio in Bedford, where he lives and works, to find out more about his life and career. Andy, welcome to the Considering Art podcast. Right, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, We're sitting in your studio. It's full of the kind of things you'd expect an artist's studio to have. It's full of uh, bits of past exhibitions, books paintbrushes, everything. But it's just more than the studio, though, is it? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's a physical manifestation of the inside of my head. It's a gallery as well, uh, although not at the moment. I've paused it because of the complications of uh, yeah, a global pandemic. We had a really lovely show this year with comedian Simon Munnery, and um, there's also the music studio upstairs, which is where the Grubby Mitts rehearse, um, but again, we're just not rehearsing at the moment. When there's no, it's very hard to keep momentum going when there's no live shows. But I've always had a space that allows me to do a number of things in one place. Well, you mentioned the Grubby Mitts, and they're from your old schoolmates, aren't they? Mm. Your school interests me because when you were at school, you came up with this alternative art movement called MIMS, Maximum Irony, Maximum Sincerity. Let me just read a bit of it you quote picasso we all know that art is not truth art is the lie that makes us realize the truth and you talk about mims being the willingness to be lied to and the will to believe it's a it's a quite a an advanced sort of thing for for teenagers to be talking about if i was to look back at some of my teenage stuff i'd probably just cringe but you were obviously quite deep thinker you and your mates even at that age weren't you I'm not sure we fully understood everything that was going into it. I mean, it was a surprise to look back at it 10 years later and find that it kind of held up. There are some slightly toe curly lines in it, but James McDowell, who was uh, the man who was more responsible for putting pen to paper, uh, is now a pretty astute 
or a really good, a good way, a good turn of phrase that allowed it to actually come out with a clarity that I think was more, maybe even more clear than it appeared to me at the time, you know. Um, but it was interesting that the ideas, I mean, th at the time, we were deeply invested in them. You know, it's what we talked about every day. It was what we kind of worked through. It's what we were doing for our performances. It was what we were trying to channel into the artwork. But it didn't really catch. It couldn't really persuade people that it, I mean, even if, who were these people we even thought we were talking to? We don't know. In, in Bedford, it just didn't. It wasn't, there was no, there was nothing for it to catch on to. There was nothing, nothing. Um, but then I took it when I went to Goldsmiths from my undergrad to art school in London. Took it with me. And I remember even then, though, actually, the tutors not being that interested in it. And it was only 10 years later when I started to notice a lot of these similar phrases bubbling up on the internet. And it allowed a kind of, obviously, the internet suddenly allowed a connectivity between lots of people doing similar things in different parts of the world and people talking about oscillation between irony and sincerity and uh, talk about the two things being um linked again uh, and the type of structure of feeling let's call it of art production that uh, this could be a useful umbrella term for i thought wait a minute that's the formulation that we kind of had back then and then i thought okay i'm going to go back to it and explore it and try and make sense of it so i've now it's now very complicated for me because i've sort of been through it twice i went through it once in real time as a teenager to sort of the cusp of 18, 19, 20, and then went through it again 10 years later as a sort of artist director, putting teenagers who were that age in to re-perform it and re-bring it back. So I've, I've been through it twice now, so it's very hard to unpick what it means to me or to, with a sincerity and a belief in the thing that you did the first time, but also an ironic distance. So it's, it's become a kind of strange knot of... A so it was, it was more than just nostalgia? Well, the revisiting it. Yeah. Yeah. But then nostalgia was always a part of the process anyway, and nostalgia was always deeply embedded in Mims, even the first time round. Or it was looking at more so the power of the kitsch image, the nostalgic image, but through a lens of a kind of irony, but also the deep sincerity that was embedded in these images. So they were actually a kind of starting point for it first time round. The second time round, by revisiting yourself, uh, I think I could be clearer that, yes, the project was looking at the phenomenon of nostalgia and how nostalgia works, which is... And looking at ideas of collective memory versus personal memory, looking at different ways that we recall the past through performance, through archive, through film and media, and, and using a number of these different techniques at once to examine the ways that we can think through the past. So, so I would always say, yes, it was about... Uh, at both stages, it was about nostalgia, just in different, with different, different depths of uh, investigation. I've always distrusted nostalgia. I always think nostalgia is a false thing because it tends to forget the, the bad bits and it's a bit like a soap opera where the boring bits are taken out. I think broadly speaking that's true and it's a sort of definition of what it is. I mean, it's a comforting glow, it's a safe mm. space, particularly, particularly precisely because it is a fictional space and it is a, it is a mental editing. I mean, the one thing for me, going back and re-going through the whole process, essentially almost went through it in real time because the project the second time to revisit it took a year and a half and um, n nearly two years and we cast teenagers t to play me and my friends in the film and then gradually uh, film the process of them re-performing the works and, re and, and reliving some of these actually precisely transcribed conversations. And then, of course, by the end of it, I um, deeply disliked the character who was playing me uh, for exactly the things he was saying were things that had actually come out of my mouth and they sounded excruciating. <laughs> and, yeah, there's one thing to sort of um, put you off nostalgia is to go back and look at the past with a, a fine-tooth comb rather than... And, it's a really tricky thing to do, and you end up really disliking your younger self. So, um, but yeah, I, I think there's to... nothing wrong in that, though. I mean, we're all we're all guilty of naivety and childishness and so on. The the thing about Mims, though, is that it, it was sort of railing against cynicism, wasn't it? It was. It is, and it's still. If there's one bit of consistency that comes out of that project into the rest of my work, it's still that. I think um, cynicism. Exactly was the enemy. People kids this is why it's and it was a lot of the trouble was articulating the difference between irony and cynicism, and irony as a kind of more romantic irony, which is a, a kind of knowledge that you might not fully ever completely connect with or be completely sort of 
in the legacy of kind of romantic literature are one with something. Um, it was also a productive force. It was a way of thinking about relativism. It was a way of actually thinking about um, without yes the protective umbrella of cynical distance. You know, in irony, actually, you can all you can be implemented. You can be within. You can be within irony and ironizing yourself as well within as a as a part within that is actually kind of. Um, and do and so do that sincerely to do that with a commitment to some kind of a notion of truth, even if that truth can't fully ever be articulated. Yeah, cynicism is almost a kind of assume you'll never know, or you know, you know that you'd, you'd be comfortable in knowing that you, not knowing what you're doing and being comfortable with it, or being just cynical of anything. So yes, to me that was the kind of the ugly side of a postmodernism that was kind of giving this detachment to people that felt like therefore you were. Um, always describe this kind of distance but do you not find it more difficult not to be cynical in our current situation with the rise of populism uh, even this pandemic yeah. yeah when i arrived at art school particularly uh cynicism was seen to be a more uh, advanced intellectual position it's like you knew you know oh because you know so much so you're cynical it's like i've already read that i've heard that we've seen that we know that they're they're corrupt this is broken that's bad this is oh this is this is they're just the effect of the market, this is the effect of capital, this is, and you're like, oh, and it's kind of an exhausting, we were trying to say that a kind of naivety and a kind of optimism could be a more radical position, because actually you're wanting, you know, rather than just going accepting things for being broken, cynicism now is the, feels like the correct de facto position that you should approach pretty much any information with, because mm. We know that informate we see the level of corruption that's going on. Yeah, we can fake see that news, it's increasing. Post truth and all that. Yeah, yeah, and how to navigate that? And it's but it's hard. It's very wearing. I think that we're all becoming kind of broken by you know. It's hard logging onto Twitter now and watching because it's just what it is. One seemingly cynical move by somebody received by you cynically. Um, it's very hard to spot. There are these little moments. It's when something like two days ago with Marcus Rashford and his. His Twitter stream suddenly flipped to just places that were giving away school meals from all over the country. It was a kind of actually deeply beautiful kind of moment of... And it was recognised as such, you know, people saying that's an incredible gesture. But it also was just that moment of piercing the cynicism. Absolutely, like, particularly like feeling it, you could feel the kind of pressure coming at him. And then this just simple gesture of just re-saying, saying the name of a place and a name where food was available was like really incredibly moving tear jerking kind of just to see it so there are these little ruptures and it's about and that would be a great example again of him kind of you know up against an incredible cynical machine and a moment of kind of sincerity and a moment of um clarity uh of what is the what is productive what is useful to do so i guess like anybody you're swimming through looking for those moments let's take you back to 2010 your first really significant piece was pyramid piece at the Tate Britain the story is of how you had stolen a fragment of rock from an Egyptian pyramid mm -hmm. and kept it and then you went back and replaced it can you give me that whole story in a, in a nutshell you've summarized it well I went to Egypt when I was about 12 10 or 12 with my dad and he was at the time had just started doing these uh, bird watching tours and they were kind of work, they were work trips for him. And I got the opportunity to go along with him. He just sort of figured that it would be a, something I should do. And it was huge. It was a kind of an overwhelming experience. It was the first time travelling, out, certainly outside, of, probably outside the UK. Maybe I think we'd been to France once for camping. But, you know, it was, it was a huge different change of perspective. But of all the things, being encountering the pyramid was this overwhelming sensation of kind of awe uh, you know a lot of this you can't unpick of what you're thinking about at the time what you th how you post rationalize it but for me it was probably through the lens of post rationalizing was uh, this first kind of encounter with the sort of monumental material it's kind of almost with thinking about s this kind of vastness of sculptural form and um and when did and you I decide to actually go and steal a bit well it was just it was just uh, a fragment that was on one of the blocks i just climbed up a couple of blocks and just there was a loose fragment so i just popped it in my pocket 
And I was kind of remember, I can't be sure if I can remember what that sensation was. I remember much clearer the sensation after of getting home and feeling bad about it and having not been sure if I could put it on my window still with my other little. I was a collector of mementos, of trinkets, of things, which you can see around the studio as a kind of continuous hobby. And how I suppose a lot of my work later becomes about how there's memory and information even get attached to objects and how fixed is that and that 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 relationship is one that underpins so much of the work but this work is the one that crystallizes that but I so I do remember it being on my window still and feeling terrible about it it becoming this kind of guilt object and wishing I could put it back the phrase that that my mum or dad said you know that if everyone did that there would be no pyramid left anyway that became this kind of formulation of a kind of primal guilt that this object sat there and the object kind of inflated in my mind it distorted because it was this sort of for some reason it became this crystallization of a thing that I shouldn't have done that I couldn't undo and probably other feelings of got put onto it but that became what it was and I, I didn't really want to look at it it kind of would but it would look at me so 15 years later I, had, I was really rethinking my art practice like I had to make some start again in a way make something different and was like what is art for me is it a formal experiment? Not really. It's, it's an emotional experiment. It's like, can I? Exp- that's what Mims was, was experimenting with emotional formations. So, so the question was to me, could something be undone? Can something be undone? You know, if you suddenly have the means to do so. So I was like, well, if I was to put the pyramid back in the piece of rock, back, take the pyramid, put it back in the pyramid, could this kind of thing be undone? And I did that, and it was a kind of interesting experiment. I made a kind of interesting video, but it wasn't quite enough. And then the idea of also having to be an emotional but also to communicate emotion requires a formal experimentation too so the transformation of the little piece of rock into a huge knitted replica um we said why 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 knitting why why this thing so well every art need it needs a leap it needs some th- a process of transformation um that you can't fully control but actually it was about how to represent the, an object in the way that it not in the way that it was but in the way that it seems uh so to me, it had become this large presence. And it had a kind of maternal, kind of superego kind of feel to it. A voice in your head that tells you you shouldn't do something. And it, it had to be something that also talked about the monumental. How do you? And so it became a transformation of uh, a piece of a monument itself becoming a monument. Or something that for you, for most people, is a trivial, insignificant anecdote in the life of somebody who themselves is trivial and insignificant. But this tiny act for them had been monumental. So it was a way of talking of the, the tiny monumental in your own kind of trivial insignificance by taking this little fragment of a monument and making that monument. And presumably you wanted to create in people's minds who saw your replica uh, some kind of uh, an awe that you felt when you saw the pyramid. Exactly. And to do that, the answer was, yeah, the labour, the labour of knitting, the, to produce a surface and a texture that no one had experienced before. It's In a way, it was one of the biggest ever handmade objects. But in a way, that the fascination of most people never encounter a handmade surface on that scale. And that does something, you know, in a very gentle way, in a sensory way. Yes, yeah, in something that you think, so anyone who encounters that won't have encountered a surface or a form like that in that way. So you'll... And the body remembers. The body remembers things that the mind can't remember. It remembers in sensations. And so the work had to have a sensation of something singular. And I think it did that. Was there a political idea too? The idea that, you know, you, we have to return the Elgin marbles back yeah. to Greece because that's where they came from. Therefore, you're returning your fragment back to the Yeah. To the when I said before, there was always a couple of things going on. I think without the moved from the personal dimension to the political dimension the work wouldn't have had the same resonance um it was interesting how that became a primary discourse once it was put up of course i was aware of it and that was almost i would say that's the the mims formation because it was kind of as ironic you know if you're really making a work about post-colonial legacy and returning you know you might do it in a sort of serious way it's a scholarly it's a serious matter you know and in a way i was doing it in a very light-hearted and sort of frivolous in a very personal way. way yeah and kind of stupid way i mean I, mean, so I so i met the tour guide out there I, well, I hung around in cairo so i found someone who could help me do this at dawn when there weren't people around and get me in through the back on horseback and so we could shoot this 
film it and I needed so I had no one with me so I also needed a cameraman so I had to pay someone I remember like we were talking about it planned it for a few days or whatever and then I eventually got the piece of rock out of my pocket on the day he's like he said oh where is it like looking around where's my bag or whatever and I was like this and he was just like laughed they just laughed their heads off it was like you know it's <laughs> it's stupid because so they they're like Obviously, no one cares about this piece of rock. So that was a kind of mims and maximum irony, maximum sincerity type formulation. You're both sincere about it, but you know there's an irony in returning some tiny piece of rock. So it's a serious subject, the post-colonial legacy, but I approached it with a very flippant... But that doesn't mean that it wasn't kind of... I, I suspected it could do something serious in its frivolousness. And it did, uh, in a way. Uh, it was interesting timing. And a lot of this is always about you know wider context. Egypt had had a campaign to get a lot of their artifacts back for the new museum in Cairo that was being built they were looking to sort of not this, um, so it got ta- my little anecdote got tagged on to a lot of these stories and in fact the British Museum got dragged into it and made a statement about not taking things from cultural sites which was, you know, brought in another layer of irony you know they, they basically sort of said the work was kind of they sort of I don't know if the Tate press office tricked them or what happened, but I mean it was a kind of dumb that in the Telegraph or something, you know, it was a sort of article saying someone from the British Museum because like, there was this idea that I was being celebrated for having stolen something. But you know, the idea of doing that in a British context of British museums is ridiculous when almost every piece of every object in the British Museum has some kind of uh, problematic edge it, to isn't it. Isn't it amazing how your little fragment suddenly has become a kind of emblem of post-colonial exploitation and a tourist icon a a part of an ancient civilization that's disappeared and it just becomes much more than a piece of rock yeah yeah this tight and again that was that movement from the absolutely arbitrary and completely innocuous i mean the piece of rock on its own see this is always my problem when i got it home it had no it just was a piece of rock it kind of went oh once you separated it from the thing that it was part of it, it was so apparently nothing, and yet it had this link to something so huge. And that's what you want. I talk about the kind of this relationship between the anecdote in the text and the object, and those, and how you can move between these two different, these diff- those constantly exploring those, how those two are inseparable from each other. Andy, let's move on to one of your other big uh, exhibitions called Natural Selection, outside your studio here is uh, one of your exhibits, which is a huge reconstruction of, of a bird's nest. I think it's the bower bird, is it not? The, the, the exhibition really, amongst other things, looked at the sculptural properties of, of bird's nests. and They are quite extraordinary. Can you just give me an ex- a few examples of, of how bird's nests are constructed and attain artistic qualities in your mind? And the bower bird's nest is important because it is really one of the only visible structures in the animal world. In my mind, it's a sculpture. It can be reduced to the idea of sexual selection, which is, I mean, not just it can be, it no doubt is a part of the Impressing concept. Impressing a mate, you mean? It's about, it's the equivalent of plumage or song. But the, the interesting thing for me is it is externalised and it requires a kind of judgement. You know, it doesn't require judgement for the bird to produce fine feathers. It's born with fine feathers. It doesn't really... I think the birds do perfect their song, uh, but the song that they're given is the same song that they're given, even if they can fine tune and sing it better. But with a bower, it requires a synthesis of judgment, choosing objects to put around it, to curve the shape, how you build it, the axis you build it along, the size that it is. And for me as an artist, that's fascinating because you're trying to look, think what connects you to the natural world? Where is this impulse? I think most people will now accept that that definition of art as some kind of extended mating ritual is probably not the case i mean it's it's there are the odd book that still kind of emerges where that sort of evolutionary i mean there's everything is part of evolution uh but as an artist of course you know your idea that anyone who plays the violin or whatever after a certain point of time you're no you're into it you become interested in its development for development's sake you're interested in it in its own category and for what it can do for you necessarily it's not necessarily even what it does for anybody else but people play do art or music totally privately it's not a it's not a display mechanism necessarily there's some other impulse at work and in the bowerbird i think is a place where we can identify that so for me that was always fascinating it was where me and my dad's interests cross over so i should say my dad is an ornithologist he spent 45 years at the rspb talking about looking at writing about enthusing people about birds so i might like anything with my projects as a sub question is where does my interest in art come from 
which you could double into where does the interest in art come from? You know, and hence the bowerbird is a useful example. Um, there's a kind of question of nature and nurture going on in the whole project. So it starts with looking at a blackbird's nest in the front garden of a house where me and my dad lived in Blunham. And I start collecting these, start bringing them into the house at the end of the season. because, And then they, they do make one, they make it again. It's not a problem as long as it's fully been used. Sometimes something else might use it over the winter. But I was looking at this one, nothing was. Uh, so I started collecting them and looking at them as sculptural objects. And saying, but every year they're... You're telling me these are just genetically, the bird just knows how to do it, just can do it. It's just, a, in, it's just an inherited kind of natural it's blueprint. It's like a sort of Jungian consciousness thing, isn't it? Yeah, so it was some sort of like archetype that it has. And I was looking at them, but every year the backbone made it slightly different. If there was more mud around, it was more mud. If there was more straw, I mean, yes, the proportions are the same, but they have to, and they have to be to hold the eggs and the young. But in the relationship material, something else was happening, not necessarily a a judgment of craft but there was an element of craft going into this thing um so i started to look at those and that became the springboard for the conversation so it basically takes you from the simple blackbird cup through to the elaborate bowerbird and that's the kind of journey the arc of the project looking at these two different ways of thinking about the same object thinking about it from a natural history perspective about uh, which takes into account yeah evolution genetics uh is it natural or is it what is it, or is it made you know it has a strange status this object it's been made but it's also natural like, so yeah. and as i talk about it as a poetic concept as an image of security and yet it's very precarious you know it has all these kind of oxymoronic qualities that i uh, paradoxical qualities that i um, would expect from a good sculptural object and the nest had that so i, I try and look at it through that lens while my dad tried to kind of describe it away through science in a kind of sort of we're playing versions of ourselves. So slightly were, you, were you complementary or almost confrontational in, in terms of your own theories? There's a, there's a warmth to the... I think it could have been interesting if it was more combative, but we're neither of us are naturally combative people, mm. so it's a very gentle... It's a gentle Socratic dialogue. You must have learned a lot from your father about birds, birds' no, nests, uh, oo- that was and... No, that's what was embarrassing. Oh, really? And that's what another plot of the film really was that... I didn't really know anything. And yet I had this... My dad's job was to enthuse young people about uh, birds and wildlife. In fact, he did it on Blue Peter. He had he did it on... He had a, another TV show where he would do this. Uh, and he had a, he, he started the Big Garden Bird Watch, which got about a million kids into the garden looking at birds. You know, this was his... Uh, he was very early on the kind of ideas of citizen science and getting young people involved in how you kind of... In how we... And his central concept is the more you know, the more you can look, the more you want to save it, the more you might want to care about it. One person, of course, who didn't really work on was his son. A lot of this was a kind of giant apology. But I did have my other, you know, I found my own thing, which was making art, and I was obsessed with that, probably in the same way he was obsessed with birds. In the do, you same think way he, do you think he learnt anything from you? Yeah, I think the piece was, in the end, but when I, we were lucky that it was seemed to be kind of a success. It ended up going to... How many, you know, six museums or something? You know, it was an amazing journey that me and my dad went on. We went to around the country for two years, putting the show on every few months and taking over an entire museum. And people were very warm to it, and people seemed really to like find something about themselves in it, find something, they should learn something about nature, which is what really was me honoring my dad's I life's work. Was, but to, just a... to bring it back, so yes, but for us, it was an incredible personal journey. It, it was of transformation. It, it, why wouldn't it be? You spend that amount of time travelling with your dad uh, and kind of relearn, yeah, learning their subject. You know, really kind of performatively and properly. It required to film it properly. Required me to take on a lot of the knowledge that I did not have beforehand. We were working in archives. Suddenly, I was finding myself at the table with the head of the birds and eggs at the American Museum of Natural History, and I didn't want to embarrass my dad. You know, so I did my tried to do my reading, but. I was always, what I found was it was easy to talk about the kind of theoretical underpinnings. So that's something that I'm, but I couldn't always remember which bird or what, <laughs> which is what my dad is particularly good at. You know, you, you can see something that's that. Mm. So we have slightly different wirings, uh, but by the end of it, and he learned, no, he, I mean, it was now he has a work in the tape. Uh, I mean, and he had never barely been interested in art through his whole life so in the same way that i just couldn't really be interested in birds because i was so immersed in art he would have been so immersed in mm. birds that he hadn't really followed been interested in art and suddenly we we, we genuinely crossed we genuinely produced something oh, <laughs> fantastic let's move on to cartoons you presumably have been into cartoons from a very early age and you your exhibition 
was called The Laws of Motion in a Cartoon Landscape. What was the basic fundamental theme of that? So, yeah, Laws of Motion is a thesis, a cartoon thesis about cartoons that posits that the world is now a cartoon or is best understood as such and therefore to understand how the world works now we need to understand not really look at the world but look at how cartoons work and look at the physics and logic of cartoons so that's what i mean by it being about it's both a theory a kind of cartoon of a theory but it's also a theory about cartoons when when you say the world is like a cartoon do you mean it's got so bad that you, you you're not surprised by anything anymore yeah, kind of. It means that an absurdity and an exaggerated form and, uh, yeah, and a sense that anything could happen and things would, were unfolding at the speed of a cartoon chase sequence, that one thing would go boom, 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 and be sort of those kind of cartoon knock-ons of destruction that people, the figures in it, were becoming kind of cartoon-like caricatures of bad people. It was a kind of Elmer Fudd or... Um, Sylvester or something. You know, there was a sort of, and sort of the, ma- the cartoon maliceness and maliciousness, but also um, physically speaking, things that had changed through social media of the representation of things operating in several places at once. And but more so, this central metaphorical kind of analogy of uh, any you know, law one in my film is anybody suspended in space will remain in space until made aware of his situation which means if you walk off a cliff edge you don't fall down until you look down only when you look down and become aware there's nothing beneath you do you then fall down and that became a useful analogy of understanding how things are kind of the suspension that we were living under uh, the 2008 banking crash become one example. Like, you know, everybody's kind of looking, looking away. No one knows. We're floating, floating. Suddenly, everyone goes, look down and go, wait, nothing. Anyone? There's no actual. And then, whoo, down it comes. Looking down is what? Self-doubt? Self-doubt, yes. And also the sort of realism idea that actually there is nothing. Just that the, there is nothing beneath there's no kind of no, no like ontological basis you know there's a kind of uh, everything's a sort of a level of abstraction and yes it would be funny if it wasn't so tragic and when you make these animated avatars of yourself mm-hmm. in which you're uh, in in the latest exhibition structure of feelings you're walking around in a cartoon landscape and various things happen in terms of, uh, you, in one, you're, you're quoting poems by Wordsworth. Mm-hmm. You get Karl Marx is quoted with a background for the Flintstones cartoon. Mm-hmm. And you have Freud's interpretation of dreams mm-hmm. uh, over another cartoon Scooby landscape. Yeah. Scooby-Doo, yeah. Um, it's the sense of the absurd going along with a kind of dystopian reality, isn't there? The, the, how would you describe that? Yeah, it's a, well, it's just to say it's a sequel to Laws of Motion. So Laws of Motion is kind of a sealed thesis. It like, has this kind of nice, neat resolve at the end uh, where Bugs Bunny says... A lot of it's about uh, you need to both know and not know at the same time. You have to become a cartoon character to survive in the cartoon landscape. And Bugs Bunny says at the beginning, you know, at the end, I know this doesn't obey the law of gravity, but you see, I never studied law. And it has this nice <laughs> kind of nice kind of resolve, neatness to that hour-long lecture. And I honed it for about five years, kind of tweaking the lecture and doing it as a performance until it resolved. The structure of feeling, which we're talking about, is now the sequel. So it's a sequel in the same way that the first the first one was an animation uh, about exploring the history of early animation. So it really looks at Walt Disney, the Bioworks, Tex Avery, Fritz Freelang, Chuck Jones, the kind of early golden age of animation. And, and actually I was thinking, well, what comes after that? In a way, of Disneyland. Spectac- Disney, like cartoon, the kind of the influence of cartoons on reality in a different way. So this is my sequel, and it's conceived as a ghost train or a theme park ride. So you, you go around it as a as a kind of DIY kind of budget theme park, gloomy kind of theme park ride. The adjective has to describe what that feeling on that ride is. I mean, the show is called the structure of feeling. You say you said it's kind of apocalyptic, did you, or did you say something? There's something. It's not quite that. I say it's a sequel. It's trying to describe what comes after laws of motion. 
and um, structure of feeling is what comes next. It hasn't really quite got a title yet of what that is because it's a feeling, a bodily feeling. It's a kind of returning of melancholy to the body. It's a kind of returning the body to the ground. It's a kind of isolate. Obviously, it's a kind of intense isolationism. It's a lack of a lack of connectivity, but it's definitely a search for meaning. Uh, and but meaning is totally unstable. We don't know yet what mean what. It was very interesting mid COVID lockdown. You know just how little meaning we had in terms of what things we thought something new before quite meant. Definitions were changing. Our whole concept of what a key worker was flipped overnight. From no, it's not you. It's you. You know like mm. things that things that so whole structures were changing. Uh, and it's describing that in a way. There was a, a very melancholy atmosphere that I got when I went to see it. And I, I just wonder whether, to put it in cartoon terms, whether the real Andy Holden is about to get squash flat by the steamroller of life. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is melancholic. It's, it's deeply melancholic. It was made across about three years, and it was deeply it, it kind of entangled with quite... Uh, with depression and yes there was a feeling of a kind of more so a severing from the cartoon self a kind of like the car- the, old cart- the cartoon avatar that I'd created for myself to kind of navigate the world my cartoon extroverted cartoon persona had been kind of killed off uh, which is what you, depression you, you does you have a sculpture of your avatar yeah. actually in the middle it, it looks like it's dead He's kind of dead or dreaming. I, 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 uh, he's also just levitating ever so slightly. And the film behind him, the big 3D film, is kind of, it seems to be almost like a dream sequence or a flickering images of a last kind of... Uh, and the light above his head just flickers as the film flickers. So he, in a way, he's just about on the verge of animation. Or is he a sculpture that's being animated? It's kind of, it's kind of both, both directions. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it, it, on a crude terms, you could say it's a kind of killing off of the cartoon the idea of the cartoon landscape in general um but they must have been really fun to do i would have thought the films yeah i could i love making those uh each one has a very different methodology i tried to make them in a more freeform way and they just don't you could just go on for it they just hard but once you have these sort of tight conceptual triangulations at the center of them which is uh where so if let's take the uh, wordsworth one it's, it's all um Deserts from Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner, uh, Chuck Jones cartoons. So you 19... take those original cartoons, take out the people, and put yours in in its place. Yeah. Right. So that's that becomes for me a stand-in for the Lake District. It comes to like Lake District post na- post environmental disaster. So I'm like, okay, that's that. Uh, Wordsworth is about is kind of this prelude specifically is this kind of him walking through the lakes trying to describe his inability to experience nature in the way that he did as he when he was growing up and a kind of this is a kind of quintessential romantic distance between person and, and landscape and so i'm kind of the character is in the landscape he's not quite touching it he's kind of floating through it he's struggling to fully connect with it and then you've got these kind of uh the caretaker uh, james Leyland kirby is on the music and the caretaker is a, a music made for the haunted ballroom in the shining that is a kind of about a sp- suspended perennial space so it uses one of uh Leyland's tracks and uh that kind of recipe was what allowed me to structure it because those things all felt like they were different enough but talking to each other that I could describe a very particular form of kind of relationship to landscape relationship to self um, the other chapter for example was Freud yeah Freud's interpretation of dreams Scooby-Doo's or Scooby-Doo haunted houses uh, and again Leyland and Caretaker uh, but the idea was that um, Freud's interpretation of dreams was the sort of first time of putting an analytical uh, interpretive structure on something amorphous and esoteric like the dream space up till then it had been some much more associated with the kind of realm of symbolism the realm of prediction the realms of mysticism and freud brought it into some any kind of schematic uh where he talks about uh, these quite neat formulations between the, the the long distant past and the very recent experience and the connections that dreams can make between the, the two and how it the recipe almost and for me that was fascinating because again it was like okay this is how do we interpret the illogical how do we interpret the absurd how do we interpret and cartoon the, the, the cartoon space so freud uh that's what that kind of and then i imagined that in a way his interpretation the scooby-doo 
house formation was like a dream formation. It's like every time you go through one corridor, another changes. And it mapped quite neatly onto a dream that I'd had that I'd recorded on my in my dictaphone. So I was like, oh, maybe the Fre Freud, we can have these kind of layers going on. Is, is Freud the character interpreting the house as a dream structure, you know, or is the dream structure interpreting the whole cartoon mm. work? Is the mm. whole work being analysed here by this through a Freudian dream lens so yeah sometimes they were very easy to to kind of get the edit and sometimes like chapter two it took three attempts over a couple of years it was like it's very hard to be weird i found like i think a lot of my work has actually been although it seems weird to people but isn't it's quite tightly structured and rational and actually to make something trippy or like in this realm that is like much more floating was really hard it often just seemed clunky or dumb or just stupidly not really weird well, just I, crap I, let me ask you that i mean you you do uh, sculpture you do animation film ceramics i think i think and painting is there a sort of common thread that that binds all these together in general i move backwards and forwards in time I have a lot of continuity in my life, or did, and you say the people I did mims with twenty years ago were still people who were in my band up till recent, or some still are. Uh, some of the themes I've been working with have been ones I've been working with since I was a teenager. But then I and I, I just keep a number of different things spinning, and then I almost jump between different the different spinning. I guess I went away to London for a few years. But then I ended up coming back and living in my childhood bedroom for another seven years while I was trying to get started as an artist because the work was getting shown but not would not sell. So I had to live with my mum and dad whilst making this work. I remember coming out of the house one morning and something just getting totally confused. I couldn't remember if I was going to school or if I was about to get the bus to go to college or whether I was going to have to get the car and go back to university. I just couldn't remember. I suddenly remember that all these things were simultaneously still going on. They were all possible. They were all still happening kind of within me and actually like the time you could you could move back if your lack of social responsibility allows you a lot of the time you're just controlled by the responsibility to have other people I right? uh but if you f free yourself from that or freed from that you can move back and forth into these streams and there is a kind of weird continuity sitting below um so yeah i guess from that sense i think there's a personal challenge to make the work seem then more disjunct there's a there's a like ever there's a there's a disjunct you know one minute yes you can the show is entirely about the natural world and birds and another moment it's complete about a, compl a cartoon world and the next thing is about adolescence and memory and irony and whatever um for me there i guess you just approach it like an author approaching a novel you know uh to you're like that's you you occupy that space semi-fictional space it draws on elements of autobiography but you move into them like sometimes you sit in within them for two or three years four years and it's yes like it's like a novel that you're chipping away at you're building a reality you're adding in extra characters you're putting in more scenery you're like suddenly a subplot appeals to you and then like and then the continuity will be often actually the shape of um that might seem disjunctive but some of the dialectics will be the same like the one we talked about earlier the relationship between the object and how the object is perceived or transformed through narrative or through nostalgia and memory and how these f are so crucial in our formulations of our concept of ourselves just really troublingly primal questions how much of what i know is my own and how much is inherited how much of it how much is it from my f parents you know how much when you come to see the world and i uh judge it as x or y where did that judgment structure come from you know where was that was that how what is nat nature and nurture how much of that was learned and how much of that was just inherited um how do i come to see the world in the way that i do what is the lens that i bring to the examination of something how much of that is from the absorbed from the media around me that i'm taking in and how much of it is something that is a judgment external to that how much am I just responding to context and how much am I bringing to the... So those sort of things, those are kind of questions that can be repackaged in many ways and always will be. There'll always be a new way of formulating those same questions. Well, you have an extraordinary active mind and a real deep thinker and it's been fascinating listening to you. Thanks so much, Andy. Andy Holden. And as usual, I've put some images from the exhibitions we talked about on the consideringart.com website. Not as usual, we're going to play out this week with music from Andy's band, The Grubby Mitts. Thank you for listening. 
This is Bob Chaundy saying, see you again. <laughs>